Good morning, everyone. It's great to see everyone here this morning, and let's stand and let's sing together today. Sounds great. You guys can all have a seat this morning. Good morning. So great to have you all here this morning. I know there's a lot of people that are on the roads today traveling back from spring break yet. And a lot of our, um, I don't want to say people my age, but the older people that went south for a couple of months. I know some of them are soon to return, so looking forward to that. But glad you're all here today. i uh, got some announcements. Uh, the adult Sunday school classes started some new classes today. The Chosen Three is meeting in the upstairs East classroom. Um, the Discovery class, which is teaching what is the covenant, what is our church about, possible membership. If you have any questions on that and would like to attend, 
Uh, we had one this morning, but we will be doing it again next Sunday morning. And we are meeting right up front here. Um, the Truth Project is meeting downstairs by the fireplace and the young adult class is meeting in the library. So if you would like to take part of any of them, I know there's room in every one of them classes, so it would be great to have you. Uh, there's a confirmation parent meeting after the worship service. Is that in the library? In the classroom. Confirmation too. And also I'll just mention there's choir practice uh, after our service. Ladies, you're invited to a bridal shower for Michaela Peterson at church next Saturday, March 25th at 10.30 in the morning. You can come at night, but it might be dark. Uh, they're registered at Amazon, Walmart, and Target. Monday, Thursday. Monday, Thursday is our, we celebrate uh, communion uh, before Easter, and there's going to be a soup supper and then the communion service, and this is really, really a meaningful service. If you've never come, I invite you to come this year. There's a sign-up uh, so they know how much to serve for soup, and uh, that's out in sign-up central, they call it, or by the coffee. Um, April 19th is our, I don't know what annual, car derby, third annual, I think. No? More than that. Okay. And uh, last year, it was set up in here, and they're racing soapbox cars that the kids are building on Wednesday night. And they will be giving out this week, this Wednesday night, them derby cars. And this place is crazy full of people and it's pretty cool. Uh, so if your kids want to be part of that, um, talk with Lynn Pickard. There's a lot more announcements in the bulletin. If you didn't get one, please grab one on your way out. If you have any prayer requests, we have a box in the back right under the sound booth, and you can put them in there, and every Tuesday morning, there's a prayer team that meets, and they will pray over them. And also, if you'd like to give to the ministries, you can put an offering in that box as well. Uh, you can also go to our uh, website, unitedcubchurch.org, and click on online giving. If you would like to sign your appendant, appendix, <laughs> you can sign mine, they hurt a little bit. Attendance pads. <laughs> uh, there's little black pads in your row. If you would sign them, please, and, and greet your neighbor.
age to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Your history can prove there's nothing you can do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I remain steadfast. And the night of when you speak. the 
throne of grace, majesty before my eyes, oh, let it take my breath. Jesus, we thank you that you are not just our Savior, but that you are our Lord, and you are the Lord of the angel armies and that million angels that are falling down at your feet. You are more than worthy. You are, you are our Lord and Savior, and you lead with power and, and strength, and we just thank you that you are a leader that is worthy of our devotion and that you have broken the chains of sin, and uh, provided a way for us to be redeemed with you. And we thank you. Amen. You may be seated. The first scripture is from Isaiah 35, 8 through 10. And a great road will go through that once deserted land. It will be named the Highway of Holiness. Evil-minded people will never travel on it. It will be only for those who walk in God's ways. Fools will never walk there. Lions will not lurk along its course, nor any other ferocious beast. There will be no other dangers. Only the redeemed will walk on it. Those who have been ransomed by the Lord will return. They will enter Jerusalem singing, crowned with everlasting joy. Sorrow and mourning will disappear and they will be filled with joy and gladness. The second reading is from Acts 16, 25 through 30. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open, he assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, Stop! Don't kill yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Thank you, Lynn. Okay, well, it's good to see everybody here today, and if you're online, God bless you. Thank you for tuning in, and um, yeah, so I sure had a nice week, and Leah, we were in Hawaii, so praise the Lord. If you get a chance, go to Hawaii, and it is very nice. We had our 25th anniversary, and some friends from Canada, um, have a timeshare thing, and they, they told us, they said, well, if you get here, then we will, you know, take care of the rest, and God bless them, so Glenn and Sue, if you're watching, God bless you, thank you, man, that was beautiful, I tell you, it is so nice, so just very um, blessed with that, and it was nice to kind of miss the storm that we had, too, so, <laughs> all right, well, um, Oh, we're going to pray, so 
Uh, we need to lift up Keith Flannan's brother, Kenneth, that has had some uh, cancer issues, and now he's in the rest, rest home. So we're going to lift him up in prayer. And also, um, Jeff and Jody Fields, are, Jody has a job in um, a 13-week uh, assignment in Alaska. So they're going to head there, I think it's this Saturday. And so we're going to pray that God will bless that time for them. They're going to Seward, Alaska, which is a really beautiful place. But it's still, a, you know, so we're just going to pray for God's blessing on that. And, um, yeah, safe travels and everything to you. So, as Mike said, if you have any kind of prayer requests, put them back there in the box. And as always, if you have something that you'd like prayer for today, um, prayer available in the library and down the hall in the prayer room afterwards. So, so let's just lift up these things in prayer. So, Father, we just say thank you for this beautiful Sunny day, Lord, thank you that the promise of spring is coming, and God, we just worship you and give you the glory today. We, we lift up Keith's brother, Kenneth. God, we pray for healing for him and, and for help, and Lord Jesus, we pray um, just be with him, and, and we, we're lifting up Jeff and Jody Fields as well, Lord, as they go to Seward. Give them a safe trip. May they have a wonderful time, help the, the work to go well for Jody, and, and so just bless their time, and we thank you, Lord. Pray for others that are traveling, and um, God, we just pray again, safety. Pray for our nation, pray for our president, our leaders, for wisdom, for help. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, pray for our missionaries around the world, and Lord, we, we lift up all the things that are each one of us has different issues that are on our heart and mind, and we just present those things to you, and we also give you thanks for your goodness to us. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so in Acts 16, so we're, we've been, of course, I wasn't here last week, but um, the last time we were together, or that I was here, we, we, we've been going through the book of Acts. And we've seen that Paul and Silas are on a missionary journey, and the Holy Spirit is leading them. They're preaching the gospel, they're planting churches, and um, the Holy Spirit has led them. Last week, we saw the Holy Spirit led them into Europe. And so, um, they, they went to a town called Philippi, which is which was a, um, a city that was actually, well, it was in Greece, would be modern-day Greece, but um, so there's obviously Greek people there, but, but there was a large Italian population there because it was a Roman colony, okay? So the Romans, when they conquered a territory, they would try to um, put colonies into those territories so that they could kind of, you know, keep control. And, and so Philippi was a Roman colony. And it, there weren't, there weren't uh, really any Jewish people, hardly any Jewish people. They didn't even have enough to make one synagogue. So it was a very, you know, Gentile kind of a place that the Holy Spirit led them to. And um, which was hard for Paul and Silas because their strategy was to go first to the Jews who understood about God, and and then to go on from there, but um, but last week we saw that we know that um, for for if a community didn't have a synagogue, the next best thing would be to have a place of prayer, and so it was kind of understood that if there was no synagogue, people would gather near the whatever community to like a river or a body of water, and then they'd have a place of prayer. And last week, Paul and Silas were able to, when they went to that place of prayer, there was a God-fearing Gentile woman named Lydia. They led her to Christ, and, um, and she became the first Christian that we know of in, in Europe. 
and then her household became Christian. And that would be the first kind of house church in Europe. So we talked about that last week, just to get us up to speed here on where we're at. So then um, today we're reading in verse 16 of chapter 16 in Acts. It says, one day as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a demon-possessed slave girl. She was a fortune teller who earned a lot of money for her master. Okay, so this poor girl is um, possessed by a demon, and she, um, you know, so this is why we always, uh, you know, I probably repeat myself all the time, but please do not play with the things of the occult. Okay, don't get your palm read. Don't play with Ouija boards. Don't go and get into magic. Oh, it's just white magic. It's okay. No, it's not okay. Okay, don't don't do it. You know, don't don't. Um, yes, that one too. Tarot cards. Don't play with those. So the whole list, right? We don't want to. We don't want to do that because. Um, because when you're playing with those things, you're actually playing with spirits, okay? They'll, they'll tell you things that, that um, well, let's just say that the Bible warns against us, against that, and so we don't, we don't do that because it's going to hurt you. It's not good. And, um, yeah, I could go on about that, but I read a, I probably shared this before too, but I read about this one girl who, when she was 13, was at a slumber party and were playing with the Ouija board. And, and, you know, she asked the Ouija board, how old will I be when I die? Dumb question. But the thing told her, you're going to be 30 when you die. So she grew up then thinking that, oh, I have this many years to live. Every birthday went by, oh, now I have this many years to live. You know, what a crazy thing. And so then finally she turns 30. How terrifying. She went through that year just filled with fear. And then she turned 31. Guess what? The devil's a liar, right? All that time of anxiety and fear, you know. So anyway, don't play with those things. If you have anything like that, get rid of it. Burn it. Burn it. Make a bonfire. I love bonfires. <laughs> get a campfire. Just throw it. Throw the garbage in. If you have pornography, pornography, throw it into the fire. Get rid of it. It's evil. It's demonic. It's going to wreck your life, okay? It's not that God wants to wreck your life. He wants to bless your life. When you play with stuff like that, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get you. Anyway, so this poor girl, her masters are making money off the demon that's in her that is telling people's fortune. And so she's a fortune teller who earned a lot of money for her masters. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. Okay, now wait a minute. This demon-possessed girl is saying something that's actually true because they really are servants of the Most High God, and they really have come to tell the people how to be saved. Why is why would she do that? Well, number one, it was really irritating. You know, she's going around shouting this stuff. But, but also, um, it had, see, the enemy has a strategy to prevent people from coming to Christ. And they're in this community, which is a very um, uh, Roman colony. And the Romans, they didn't, Let's just say that they, a lot of them didn't really care for the Jewish people that much because the Jewish people were always set apart. You know, they, always, they only worshipped one God as opposed to the multiple Roman gods. They didn't, um, you know, offer sacrifices to Caesar because that would be, you know, for the Jewish people, that's, that's wrong. You shall have no other gods before me, you know, the first commandment. So there was always this kind of separation and 
and a little bit of animosity between these two groups. And, and so for these Jewish men to come in to the town and have someone saying, hey, these folks are here to tell you about the Most High God, you know, it, it wasn't, let's just say it wasn't very, um, it, it wasn't drawing people, okay, to the gospel. It, it had the opposite effect. And so this is really disturbing. It's kind of wrecking Paul and Silas's mission in that community. Uh, this went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And instantly it left her. Instantly it left her. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And if, you, and if you're born again and the Holy Spirit lives in you, then you have authority over wicked, evil things from the devil, and you can say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to get out of there, get away from, get away from me, and it will go, it will go, you have the authority in Jesus' name, praise God for that, so that's what they did, her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered, because she doesn't have that spirit anymore, so they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews, they shouted to the city officials. They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. Was that true? No, but they're just upset, so they're making up these false accusations. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. Okay, so there's no trial. <laughs> there's no, there's, they're just, strip. can you imagine the humiliation? You're, you're stripped, you're naked, and people are beating you <laughs> with wooden rods. I mean, that's pretty horrible, right? And um, they were severely beaten. Okay, so they weren't just roughed up a little bit. They were, they had the tar beat out of them. I mean, they're just, it's horrible. They were severely beaten. Then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. And by the way, if in those times, if you were a jailer, um, it's kind of be like, it's, in a way, it's kind of like being a zookeeper. You just you you didn't treat people very well. You're just maybe giving them enough to eat barely but it was really a rotten place to be. And if you're a jailer and somebody escapes from your jail, you have to pay with your life. Okay, so he's going to make sure. So jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. What a horrible position to be in, to be in that stinky, probably rat-infested place after you've been humiliated and beat up and what a dark experience. But it says around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Think about the darkest situation that you can imagine. And these guys are worshiping the Lord. They're singing, you know, hymns to God. They're praying. They're I mean, can you imagine that? That is really powerful. And I think, that, I think that there's a lesson for us in this and that when we go through the darkest things in our life, if, if we can offer up a sacrifice of praise, there, there's a, I mean, that is really powerful to do that. Because it's easy to praise God when you just come back from Hawaii, you know, Thank you, Lord. More, more, more of that, you know. <laughs> more. Yeah. I'm telling you, why does everybody want to live in Hawaii? Because it's so nice, you know. I mean, it is beautiful. Every day is like 75 degrees. Every day. It doesn't, like, yeah, it is so beautiful. I, I can't believe the, the, the flowers and the, it just is so nice, the ocean, you know, and you can snorkel, and there's these. 
<laughs> but it's really fun. I didn't know what I was doing, but it was really fun. And, you know, the fish are bright yellow. Anybody ever done that in Hawaii? Like bright yellow fish? And there's, I mean, you can't believe in evolution if you go to snorkeling. I, I don't know how you could. Because the fish, I mean, there's this one that's multicolored. Like, it is so beautiful. Anyway, I could go on about it, but um, I got off track. Something about, yeah, okay, something about Hawaii. Anyway, so, um, but they were, in, they were not in Hawaii. <laughs> they, were, they were in a dungeon, and, there were, and, and still they're worshiping God, right? Praising God. If you can, if you can begin to, pr when you go through your darkest thing, you just say, Lord God, I just want to give you the thanks and the praise right now in Jesus' name. Because the Bible says that give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And even though it's really hard, and you're suffering, and you're going through a lot of hardship, you begin to, to praise. These guys are singing hymns to the Lord. And the, others were, the other prisoners were listening. You see, when we go through hardships, there's other people that are wondering, how are we going to deal with this? Right? It's like, oh, you're going through a hardship? How? Well, okay, here's Mr. Christian guy. How are they going to deal with it now? Right? We're going to see if it's real, right? People are curious if, if that's real. And so the other prisoners are listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake. So I'm just going to say one other thing on that, and and that is that um, I think that there is, there's real, again, there's real power in it when we can worship the Lord in the midst of suffering. And, and I think, I, this is just my, so this isn't scripture right now, but just my opinion is that it brings a, something is going to, something is going to break in the supernatural world when you begin to do that. And so that's what I think, that what we see here is a manifestation of that. It says, suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open. So that prison is a physical representation of oppression in that society, of the unjust garbage that's going on to these people. And when they're worshiping God, it's like... It just exploded it, and all the doors immediately flew open. The chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself because he thinks, well, my prisoners have escaped. The Romans are going to kill me, so I might as well just get it over with. And he's about to kill himself, but Paul shouted to him, stop. Don't kill yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? Now, I've often read this, and I, and I think, okay, here's this like pagan jailer. What does he know anything about being saved? Isn't that kind of Christian language? Like, how would he even know what, about that? But their, their testimony of worshiping and, uh, in the midst of suffering is so powerful that, and here's another thing, what I think, you know, um, how did they get in jail in the first place? Well, by casting that demon out of that demon-possessed girl that was going around saying, these men are servants of the Most High God. They have come to tell you how to be saved. So, you know, the strategy of Satan blows up in Satan's face, right? And he's like, hey, you know, he's trying to wreck it for him, and, and somehow this jailer hears about what being saved. The devil didn't see that coming, right? But, so here they are, they're, they're, he says, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him 
and with all who lived in his household, even at that hour of the night, the jailer called for them and washed their wounds, or cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. Isn't that beautiful? They, they all came to the Lord, immediately baptized. He brought them into his house and set a meal before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. That's beautiful. Salvation came to that house. It came to that home, and, and they're just rejoicing and went from being lost to being found, from going to hell to going to heaven. That's something to rejoice about, isn't it? To be able to say, I'm on my way to heaven. I can leave the garbage behind. And praise God that the blood of Jesus washes away our filthy sins. And through Jesus Christ, we can be saved. We can be set free. Our filthy past is forgotten. Isn't that beautiful? As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. No matter what kind of thing you were involved in, what mistakes you made, the Lord chooses to remember it no more. Praise God. Can somebody say, thank you, Jesus? Thank you, Jesus. Because it's so good to be saved. Because, you see, God knows everything. God sees everything. And every one of us is going to have to stand before him one day and give an account of our lives. Everyone. Nobody gets off that one. But praise God that if we have Jesus, if we have Jesus, we're set free and we're welcomed into the eternal home, which is heaven. That's good news. That's the gospel. And, and that only happens not through our good works, but through Jesus Christ. And that jailer and his family received Christ, and at that very late hour or early hour in the morning, whatever it was, they're rejoicing, praising God for that. Don't ever believe the lie of the devil that will tell you um, that you can't be saved. And don't let him tell you, oh, but God didn't really forgive you for that one. Maybe there's something you did, something back then, and the devil will come at you. He'll say, yeah, he didn't really forgive you for that one. Yeah, he did. It's because when Jesus, what did he say when he was at, at the end? at the cross. What was his words? It is finished, right? It is finished. It's done. And praise God for that. And maybe there's somebody here today that wants to begin their new life with Jesus. Man, I would just rejoice. Actually, all heaven rejoices when anyone comes. So I pray that there's someone here today. I pray that there's more than someone. <laughs> I pray there's a whole bunch of people that will come to Jesus today. Praise the Lord. That's what I always want to see happen every day. Praise God. Okay, so um, the next morning, the city officials sent the police to tell the jailer, let those men go. The city officials sent the police to tell the jailer, let those men go. So the jailer told Paul, the city officials have said, said, you and Silas are free to leave. Go in peace. But Paul replied, they have publicly beaten us without a trial and put us in prison. And we are Roman citizens. So now they want us to leave secretly? Certainly not. Let them come themselves to release us. Man, Paul is just, Paul has um, moxie right? He's just like, the guy just got beat up, and now he's saying, no, we're not going silently. They got to come down here and grovel. They're going to have to apologize. I mean, that's just, that guy's crazy. So, <laughs> but that's what he said. Um, when the police reported this, the city officials were alarmed. They're like, oh, we didn't know they're Roman citizens. If you put a Roman citizen in chains and had them in prison, you could, it was severe. 
Like you, you could, um, it, it, it was not going to go well for you, okay? It, you didn't do that. And, and it was, so the, the city officials were alarmed to learn that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. So they came to the jail and apologized to them. Oh, we're sorry. They apologized to them. Then they brought them out and begged them to leave the city. They're like groveling. Begged them to leave the city. When Paul and Silas left the prison, so did they leave the city then? No, they didn't. <laughs> they returned to the house of Lydia. They're like, we're not going until we're ready to go. <laughs> we're not going to obey you. We're going to do what God wants us to do. So they, um, they returned to the home of Lydia. There they met with the believers and encouraged them once more. Then they left town. So what did this do? This elevated the status of the church in that community because the very officials were the, you know, it's like, whoa, Paul and, and Silas, you know, they're, they're um, all, all of a sudden that, that church, uh, it, it had a standing in that community and it began to grow. And we know that it began to grow because Later, Paul would write a letter to that church. It's called Philippians. And Paul always had a very close relationship with that church. And that church loved Paul, and Paul loved them. And, and that really comes through in that book. Okay, I'm just going to go on a little bit more here. Um, I, I just want to go back to that thing about when Paul and Silas were in prison. Because, you see, I think a lot of us, and maybe myself included, would be very tempted to say to become bitter at God and to say, God, how I'm here preaching the gospel, I'm doing your work, and you let you allowed me to get beat up and stripped and beaten and thrown in prison and humiliated, and how could you let this happen? You know, we, you could become bitter at God. But that wasn't the way Paul was or Silas because they or any of the other apostles because they believed, they just thought, in their mind, they just thought that following Jesus probably meant that there was going to be some hardship. I don't think they thought of anything else because that's just part of Following Jesus. I mean, didn't Jesus say, if you want to follow me, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me? Is, and didn't Jesus actually, <laughs> the very founder of Christianity, die on a cross, a horrible death? You know, so um, that's just what they experienced. And, and Paul, I'll just go on with this for just a second here. In, in 2 Corinthians, I mean, Paul knew what suffering was. And he says in 2 Corinthians 11, 24, this is just a partial list of some of the things that he went through. Okay, he, Paul says, five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. 39 lashes. You know what? If somebody whipped me 39 times, I don't know that I could make it even one time. This guy did it. That happened to him five times. That's crazy. Um, okay, where was I here? Uh, five, okay, 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. We just read about one of them. Three, that happened to him three times. Once I was stoned. We read about that a couple weeks ago. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers, I have um, faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I've worked hard and long and during many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I've shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep warm. Then beside all this, I have daily... The, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. And it goes on. But 
So Paul knew about suffering, okay? Paul knew about suffering. These folks knew what suffering was. And I think that sometimes in, in our culture, and maybe it's just because it's human nature, we're, we spend our lives avoiding suffering. And it's not that, um, I mean, I'm not here to go looking for suffering, you know, but, but we're just so, and, and we, think, we think that if you suffer, it's really bad. Because it is not, I mean, it's not good. I mean, it's not pleasant. You know, it's not, um, but here's the, uh, here's the thing. Sometimes, um, so we do everything we can to avoid suffering, but sometimes suffering is actually a part of God's will for us. Now, you don't hear that very often, and it might not be a popular thing to say, but sometimes suffering is actually a part of God's will for us. And Jesus himself, in Isaiah 53, verse 3, it says, He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. He was a man of sorrows. That's who Jesus was. He knew suffering. And the, the suf again, the suffering that he went through on the cross was way more than anything that anybody can imagine because not only did he physically suffer, but he took my sins and your sins and all the sins of the world on himself. He who did not sin, became sin in our place. And so he suffered more than anyone. And um, and think about this. After Jesus was baptized, where did the Holy Spirit lead him? Well, the Holy Spirit immediately led him out into the desert where for 40 days he's tempted by Satan and he goes without food. For 40 days he suffers. And um, anyway, so when, when we're in the season of Lent, you know, we think of, we reflect on the sufferings of Christ. We think about his price that he paid. We think about that. First Peter, so Peter is another one who knew about suffering. First Peter 4.19, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. When we suffer, we're participating in the sufferings of Christ. And I'm not just talking about physical suffering. I mean, that is a type of suffering. But sometimes it's loneliness. Sometimes it's depression. Sometimes it's... The list goes on, okay? There's a lot of different kind of sufferings that you can go through, okay? But rejoice in so much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will, hear that, according to God's will. Sometimes it is God's will that we suffer. So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. And in the face of it, of your suffering, continue to worship the Lord and continue to praise him and sing those hymns and songs and spiritual songs unto the Lord. Okay, but I want to tell you this too. I'm going kind of long today, but I'll be done soon, so don't worry. Okay, um, Romans 8.18, Paul said this. 
He said, yet the, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed to us later. Isn't that beautiful? The sufferings that we have now is temporary, right? But the glory is going to, is going to far outshine that. And so just be encouraged with that. And G, it says that Jesus suffered for the joy set before him. He endured the cross. The joy is even greater. The glory is even greater. So better things are coming, okay? So even though you might have to suffer, and don't, so here's the point. One of the points I want to make here today is that if you're going through something, don't feel, man, God must not like me, or God must be mad at me, or maybe I did something that I deserve this. Well, maybe you did something that you deserve. I'm not, okay, maybe you did, but you know what? Maybe you didn't. Maybe you're just suffering. And the point is, don't be thinking that God is your enemy, that he hates you. That God loves you. And, and the things that you go through down here, the disciplines we go through, they're ultimately for our own good. And I'll say my verse once again, that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. We might not see it till the very end, but ultimately, just stay with the Lord, and you're going to see it someday. Okay, one last thing from, again, from 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10 is the last one. It says, in his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. All power to him forever and ever. Amen. And so let's just pray this together as the team comes up. Lord God, we just say thank you that no matter what suffering we're going through, God, that you're with us in it, that you walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death, and sometimes we, have, we, we do go through things. But Lord, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Yes, we, we're going to continue to pray for healing for people. And we'll never stop. And God, we're going to continue to pray for blessing. And we thank you that we're, we can join with our brothers and sisters that are in suffering. And that's, that's the strength of the church, that we surround those that are going through hardships. And God, we want to say thank you that we can support one another and pray for one another. And God, we thank you that we don't have to do it alone, but that we have the body of Christ, but we also thank you that your presence is with us in the midst of the darkest place, Lord. And we thank you, Jesus, that you've always gone before us. That there's nothing that's some kind of mystery to you. You know all about it. So God, I just pray, especially today, for those that are going through kind of su suffering, maybe a long-term suffering even that's been going on. But Jesus, you're going to bring us into the glory. And I pray that your glory just rests especially, Father. Thank you, Jesus, on those that are going through stuff right now. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. So after we sing our last song, I just want to say that if there's somebody that needs to receive Christ, that do it today. Do, do not wait another day, okay? If the Holy Spirit's calling you, um, do it today. It takes courage to start that walk, but you're never going to regret it. So receive him today, and, and if you are in some kind of suffering, get some prayer, okay? God is going to pour out a blessing on you today. So let's worship the Lord with this. Let's stand. You stood before creation, eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stay. stood before my failure and carried the cross for my shame. My sin 
So again, please uh, enjoy some prayer. If you need some prayer and choir, we'll begin in about 10 minutes up here. So um, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you and have a wonderful week.